Good evening, everyone. I'm Farrah Kraus, 3 gny board member and grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. Welcome to our event, Exploring University of Southern California Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive. Tonight's program is in partnership with 3GNY, 3GNJ, 3G Philly, and of course, USC Shoah Foundation. We're grateful to collaborate with these wonderful organizations as we collectively remember and share our family stories. Today, we'll be joined by Crispin Brooks and Rachel Cerati from USC Shoba Foundation. For those joining us for the first time, welcome. We're happy to have you with us. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. 3GNY's flagship educational program, We Educate, or We Do, is a four-week training program that empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their families' Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. One large piece of sharing our stories is finding out the details, which can sometimes be difficult if our grandparents are no longer with us or they don't openly speak about what they went through. Thanks to vital resources like USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, we're able to research and learn more about our family history. The archive is home to nearly 55,000 testimonies from survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust. Today's event will be a hands-on tutorial for how to use the archives to deepen our exploration of our grandparents' histories, which will lead to more detailed and colorful stories for us to share. I'm personally thankful for the work of the USC Shoah Foundation. Growing up, my bubby Eva shared many anecdotes and descriptive stories of her survival. However, when I first sat down to prepare to share her story through We Do, I was having trouble with the timeline. In fact, I wasn't even aware of all the camps she was in. But thanks to the archive, I found three and a half hours of her testimony that filled in the gaps and helped me complete my story that I now share regularly with students. I'm privileged to share my bubby's story and teach students. We all know that, the, that Holocaust education is critical and urgent. Given the horrifying rise of anti-Semitism we see in the headlines and on a daily basis, including last weekend's extremely distressing incident in Colleyville, we need to keep doing this work as much as we possibly can, now more than ever. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Crispin Brooks and Rachel Cerati. Crispin, as curator of the USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, has been with the organization for more than 23 years, developing deep expertise about the archive from watching more than 5,000 testimonies, supervising its indexing work, interviewing survivors, and working with scholars and filmmakers. He speaks three languages, and his most recent co-edited publication is Beyond the Pale, The Holocaust in the North Caucus. Rachel Cerati is a 3G award-winning author, photographer, educator, and audio producer, as well as the inaugural storyteller in residence for USC Shoah Foundation. Her critically acclaimed podcast and memoir, both of which are titled We Share the Same Sky, tell the story of her decades-long journey to retrace her grandmother's Holocaust survival story. Rachel has been collaborating with USC Shoah Foundation on various projects since 2018, and currently is producing a podcast with them called The Memory Generation. Rachel's originally from Boston, but is now based in Portland, Maine. Crispin and Rachel, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi, everybody. It is great to be with you. Um, thank you to everyone at 3G New York and for all the children and grandchildren of survivors who are on this call today. Um, we look forward to sharing the Visual History Archive with you. And hi, Crispin. It's nice to do this with you. Um, so before we kick off, I'm just going to give a little bit of intro to um, what is the Visual History Archive and what is the Shoah Foundation. So um, I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. My grandmother, Hannah Dubova, is the, um, the, the centerpiece of my the work that I've been doing since I was 20 years old. I've been working on a story about her, a project about her story for um, like going on 13 years now. And I was doing research for like seven years before I ever knew about her testimony with Shoah Foundation. So I was one of those grandchildren that there might be a lot of us in the audience who was like, yeah, I think my grandmother was interviewed by Spielberg at one point. Um, but I really didn't know what that meant. The word testimony didn't really mean much to me. Um, I came from the journalism world. So I had a different idea of what testimony meant, a different idea of what an interview uh, meant. And then 
back around uh, 2017, 2018, I was contacted by Stephen Smith, who uh, just left, but was the executive director of Shell Foundation, asking me if my grandmother was in the archive. And um, I was like, yeah, I think so, maybe. And within a few hours, I had a four and a half hour testimony of hers that completely and totally changed the direction of my work. And so if anybody has listened to the We Share the Same Sky podcast, the audio that you hear of my grandmother is from the testimony that she gave to Shoah Foundation. So a little bit um, about Shoah Foundation is that it was started in 1994 by Steven Spielberg after he made Schindler's List. There are currently over 55,000 testimonies in the archive. Um, over 50,000 of them are Holocaust survivors and witnesses. There are testimonies conducted in 65 countries and 43 languages. Um, so there is so much there. Maybe you have a family member in the archive, um, or maybe you don't, but you're looking for more information, some stories, some insights, some anecdotes, some memories from a specific place that perhaps you know your family history came from. So today we're gonna take you into all of that, show you how to navigate the visual history archive. Um, if you have any questions, I encourage you to put them into the chat or the Q&A. Some of them we'll address during the program. Some of them we'll address in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, so with that, Chrisman, come on back on and we will kick off. Okay, hi, how are you? <laughs> well, thank you. How are you? Joining you from uh, a pleasant evening in Los Angeles. Just yes. Down here. And so, it is a very cold evening in Maine. So we are like literally on polar opposites, but here together on Zoom. Um, so before we dive in and you're going to, most of this program, you're going to share your screen and we're going to do a really hands-on tutorial. But first, you've been working with Shoah Foundation for 23 years, I believe I'm correct. Yeah. 23 years. So tell us a little bit what, about what you do there, but also, and can you tell us what is an archive and more specifically, what is the visual history archive? Okay. Uh, what I do there, so my job title is curator of the archive. And what I do is a number of things. Um, I guess primarily what I've done over the years is kind of work on the indexing of testimonies. So we have lots of testimonies, uh, something like 55,000, uh, 54,000 of which are Holocaust testimonies. So uh, I would I always tell the students at USC, that's 13 years of continuous video. And then I say, and we're gonna press play and then start watching together. And they all go, oh. Uh, but the point of all this is just the indexing work was to be able to help people find things. So whether it was the name of somebody, whether it was a birthplace of somebody, the times, the places, the events, the organizations, the concepts, the stories that people talk about, give ways uh, so that we can navigate through this enormous archive of memories and find things that we're interested in and that are important and that we're looking for. So that's kind of the indexing world. I've also you know, more recently been involved in doing interviewing work um and working on bringing in collections and media work and, and all sorts of other things and research work right now um uh okay you had two other questions what is an archive what is an archive and what is the visual history archive yeah so the the standard meaning of an archive is is like a place where um, historical documents or, or records, um, uh, public records are kept, right? Yeah. So yes, the Visual History Archive is that because the, the testimonies of survivors and other witnesses of the Holocaust and other genocides are exactly historical documents. And so yes, we're a place that holds um, uh, th these these records, if you want to call them records, testimonies, we call them. Um, but also what we've done is we've digitized them all and indexed them to make them searchable. So the Visual History Archive is really our search tool, which holds all of the testimonies and then makes them available to be viewed. Great. I probably could talk loads more. But yeah, yeah, well, we're going to get into it because we're going to show it hands on so people can really understand it because you and I know exactly what that means, but most people on this call do not. Um, so just before we get into and we're going to show an example of what indexing is, because I'm sure that word doesn't mean a lot to people and maybe even, um, you know, we're going to 
kind of unwrap all the different ways we can get into this archive. But just before we do that, just one last question, which is testimony. Um, as I previously mentioned, I didn't actually really know what testimony was until I, until I started working with Shoah Foundation. And now I feel like it's the word that I probably use most frequently in my vocabulary. So I came from the journalism world. So the idea of sitting down and interviewing somebody was very, it was a very intentional process. Um, oftentimes when you work in journalism, you kind of know what story you're seeking to get, you kind of know what you want to write or what you want to photograph or whatever media you're using. What is testimony? Like what, what are we about to look at and explore? Well, uh, testimony on, on the one hand is an interview, right? So it's uh, in, in our case, most of the time, one interview or one interviewee talking to each other, but it's, it means a bit more. It's not just sort of interview is such a neutral word. Testimony is a word I think that was particularly important to many survivors when they gave testimony, because te I mean, testimony has the, the legal sense, right? We talk about legal testimony, but it's something about bearing witness to events of historical importance. And in this case, you know, the Holocaust of extreme historical importance and events which the survivors themselves were sometimes the sole witnesses of, but the sole, certainly the sole uh, people that can talk about their own experiences of this kind of big historical event, this big, you know, terrible, um, you know, genocide is the word that came about from 1948 onwards to describe these things. But so, so it was people bearing witness to that. It wasn't just another kind of interview that it could be for anything. So really talking about uh, oral history here. So the, like, yeah, so yeah, so it's beginning, an middle, history. and end of of yeah. yeah okay, I, I see. Uh, yes, so it's not an interview like you, a journalistic interview where the the questions get straight to the point. Uh, and uh, we've had this discussion before. That are often very leading questions. This is basically a life history w with a focus on the Holocaust period. Right, so we always ask people about where they came from and where they were born and their upbringing and their family and their background and what happened after the war and where they went and what they did and the families they had and, and this kind of thing. But we focus it around, sorry for the external noise, uh, we focus it around the Holocaust. That was our reason for recording the interviews. So it's, uh, and then different from the other different thing, I think I would say from journalistic interviews, we try to ask as much as possible open-ended questions. So p please, can you describe something rather than journalists tend to pack a lot in and ask, you know, three or four questions at once and have opinions expressed in, in the questions. So it's a very different form. And hopefully, you know, typically our interviews are about two hours, two and a half hours long. Uh, and, and longer sometimes. Great, so so let's dive right in. <laughs> let's uh, give the people what they came here for, which is the Visual History Archive. Uh, so we're so so what we're going to do right now, everybody, is we are going to essentially take a little journey through the archive that Crispin is going to lead us on. Um, we are going to dig a little bit into my grandmother's testimony, and then a lot of the questions that I had going in of what else can I find in here? Because I think one of the very beautiful things about this archive is that um, it's not, this is not just information about our own families, but it's really information about, that helps fill in a lot of gaps, how help, helps give perspective um, and really kind of each testimony offers a little lens into a place, into an experience group that helps us be able to talk about our family histories better because we're talking about a town that somebody came from or maybe a camp that they were in um, or maybe where they went after the war being able to explore other people's experiences really allows us to tell a much fuller story um, so we're going to go into some of that as well okay and so just just before jumping right in what the first question in the Q&A was how do I access things online and the answer is, uh, this is how you access things online. We have a thing called the VHA online.usc.edu. So that's the address of our online version of the VHA, the Visual History Archive. And the online version of the VHA has 
um, about 4,000 interviews that are watchable, but you can search the entire archive. And if the interview you're looking for isn't one of the 4,000 that's in here, it'll direct you to a site uh, where you can access it. Um, also, you can, as, as uh, descendants, as relatives of survivors, you can also contact us and we'll share a free video link with, with the testimony you're looking for. So, and I just wanted to say, so just highlight this, vhaonline.usc.edu. Rachel, I don't know if you want to put that in the chat. Already done. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so Synergy. Enough. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, if, if you haven't already joined, register. It's a free registration. You give yourself a username and password, which is, is yours. Obviously, I have, after getting on for 24 years, I do have my own username and password. There. And then you get into this. This is our search tool. Um, and, yes, this is, this is the 13 years worth of continuous video, and I'm looking for the play button. I can't find it. <laughs> Rachel, where should we start? Where should we go from here? Yeah, so, um, well, first everyone can see that there's all these different ways of narrowing down your search. So you're going to see all of the different experience groups that we have in the VHA. So it's not just Holocaust uh, survivors and witnesses, but also individuals who survived the Armenian genocide, the Nanjing massacre. We see here the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and so on and so forth, as well as there's some interviews that uh, dig into contemporary anti-Semitism. So if that's something that you would like to talk about in your presentations as you retell your family history, um, those might be uh, important interviews for you to watch. So you have all these things, people, places, and in a little bit, Crispin's going to take us into the deep into the world of, of indexing. Um, but first, so Crispin, let's search for my grandmother. So I knew her as Mutti. That's what we all called my grandmother, which means mother in German. But her name as she was born was Hannah Dubava. And the way I spell it in my work um, is H-A-N-A-D-U-B-O-V-A. -A -A. And so anybody who has Czech uh, lineage, the OVA is what's given to every female. So like her male relatives would be Dub and then hers is Dubova. So that would be, yeah. that would be what I would search. So the, and, I would type into the first name and last name field. And then I would even, because I know you're looking for the interview with this person, not just somebody who's talked about in an interview, but the actual interview of that person, we can check this box interviewee only and then hit search. And which is not there because she does not use yeah, her does happen. Yeah. because my grandmother has a different spelling of her name everywhere I go. So <laughs> let's try H-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, um, and then maybe just D. Let's see what we have. Oh, okay. Oh, or she came up with the full last name. Well, or see also when she must have listed her maiden name, she put two N's in it, which yeah. is something she started doing when she came to America. So. You know, yeah, you could, you're right. You could, probably, if you'd done the same thing, just the D would have worked. It would have got more results, but including. The right. Actual. So, so if you're someone who doesn't, you're like, oh, I think I have a family member. I don't know how to spell their name. Like there's different ways for you can search. So don't get deterred if you, um, if you don't find out on first try. So yeah, let's, let's check her out. When you see. check on that and then you hit next down at the bottom, then it brings you there. And yeah, this is her interview. Let's okay. should I play a moment of it. Sure, you can pick a little, pick a little spot here. Let's jump it forward. Takes a moment to load up. Mm -hmm. It's like 50 kilometers east of Prague. You can see a little picture of me in the background there as a Did you have a nine-year-old name at birth? Yeah, I had a Other side. which they never used, but it was Dagmar. D-A-G-M-A-R, and it was named after a Danish princess who married a, somebody in the Bohemian and who was very favored, who had a big favor again for the Jews. So um, a, couple, a couple things to note. Um, on a personal note, I love that her middle name was Dagmar, which was named after a Danish princess because she ended up being rescued by the Danes. So there was something very special in there. Um, but two questions that came up in the chat that I want to quickly address was that someone a little bit earlier on was, you know, I noticed this has subtitles and it has uh, captions to it. Um, does every testimony have captions and subtitles? No, not yet. So, um... 
all of our German language testimonies is about around about 800, 790, 800. All of them have German to German subtitles. And about another, I think it's up to around 3,000 now of our English language ones have uh, English language like transcript subtitles. Um, yeah. And that's something that we're adding. We have a relationship with ProQuest and part of our deal with them is that they're transcribing the interviews for us. So, you know, every every six months or so, they release another, tra you know, tranche of, of the subtitles. So it's increasing every few months. But it's, you know, it's a slow process. If you've ever tried to do this for yourself, you'll appreciate how, how difficult uh, this can be. And even with all the modern day kind of automatic transcripts, they miss all the specifics and the kinds of things that survivors say in, in multiple languages, um, all the proper nouns and all that kind of thing, as well as sometimes with the English, the, the, the automatic transcript just renders it differently from what, the way it should be. So tricky process, but yeah, we're adding it all the time. And what about translation? Somebody earlier in the chat asked, you know, they said that they had, um, Daniel asked, he said, since his grandparents emigrated to Venezuela and their testimonies aren't Spanish, he wanted to know if there are subtitles in English or if there's a way to include subtitles. So where are we at with translations of? So uh, where we're not anywhere at with translations at the moment, basically our English ones are in English, the non-English are in non-English. Um, some of our other testimonies now we build into the process of bringing in new collections. Um, you know, some like the Rwandan and Armenian, many of them, if not most of them, have English language subtitles. But we didn't for the original collection of, you know, the, the Holocaust uh, survivor collection. Um, and, you know, a lot of the reason for that is cost. Several, uh, just a quick anecdote. Um, I approached a translation agency, a couple of translation agencies about 15 years ago, and, you know, just, just interested, how much would it cost to get all, let's say, all of the non-English testimonies translated into English? And they were like, oh, great, we'd do you a deal. It'll be $19 million. So... $90 million. The sense of, you know, the, what we'd be facing if we went at it. Um, and even with Google Translate, I mean, you know, I don't know. If you think the transcripts are shaky, automatic transcripts are shaky, it's it's quite a lot shakier when you, you bring in Google Translate onto things like this. Yeah. So basically, if you want something translated, it's kind of a pers like personal choice that you can do it, which actually is great because that'll lead us to our next video. So a little background is... My grandmother was from Czechoslovakia. She ended up um, surviving the war, being the only one in her family to survive the war. She was rescued by the Danes. So a lot of my work takes me to Scandinavia. And through a lot of family history I've done, I became very close with uh, a man named Rabbi Ben Melchior, who happened to be on the same rescue boat as my grandmother in 1943. It's a whole thing. Um, and so Rabbi Bent Melchior was a Holocaust survivor from Denmark. So you know, I'm curious if he is in the archive. I'll have a look. I'm yes. assume, assuming that's the spelling. That is the spelling. Yeah, so I got it right. Okay, yes. so interestingly, I, I forgot to check the interviewee only button. So you'll notice these three all come from his interview, I uh -huh. think. But this one he's talked about in another interview here. Wow. I have I should listen to that. I actually I yeah. didn't even know about that one. So very oh, cool. interesting. Yeah, he's he's the religious leader in the interview of but yeah, yeah. So he 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 ended up becoming the the chief rabbi of Denmark, as was his father, as now is his grandchild. And we'll get to his grandchild in a moment. So here's Ben's interview. So when I found this, I was like, wow, this is really amazing. And then I realized, yeah, coming. It's all in Danish. <laughs> So, um, as much as I've spent a lot of time living in Denmark, I can't say that my Denmark is uh, all that good. My Danish is all that good. So, um, but here you can see, thank you to the indexing. So let's take a quick minute there. Even though I don't speak Danish, the indexing is in English. So at least I have an idea of what he's talking about. So maybe, you know, just, just to say, I want to learn about what his, you know, about what his bar mitzvah was like. And I see here in segment seven, 
he's talking about his B'nai Mitzvah. So maybe if I wanted to get it translated, that might be a space where I could go to someone who speaks Danish and say like, hey, can you just look at this tape from, you know, minute 10 to minute 17, I'm making it up, but, you know, and could you just translate those seven minutes? Because I know he's talking about this one thing there that I really want to use. And of course I'd like the whole thing translated, but as you mentioned, it's uh, timely and costly. <laughs> um, so those are, those are ways in which that you can like really use indexing to your advantage um, by not having to go down rabbit hole. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I really love watching testimony and it's a great time to puzzle. And so sometimes I do those two activities together, but not everybody wants to sit and watch four hours of oral history at a time. Um, it's a special hobby. <laughs> so if I think, you're, I think not, you're right. I mean, you know, if you look at the indexing like this, so this is the indexing, right? So the same as where you might have uh, on a page of, a, uh, in the back of a book, you have the page numbers saying, oh, on page 12, he talks about uh, Danish people, right? Well, here, it, instead of it being page 12 of a book, it's minute 12 of this testimony. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're interested in uh, learning about the Jewish National Fund, well, one of the places you could do that is minute 14 of this testimony, if you happen to speak Danish. Um, but there'll be many other testimonies in different languages, including English, given right. that half the archives in English. Right. But also, like you say, you can quickly scroll through this indexing and it kind of can function a, a, a bit like the table of contents of a book. Right. You can kind of look over this and say, oh, he's in pre-war Copenhagen. Oh, well, actually, his family comes from Boyton, Germany. Uh, and you can get an idea of where and when he was, of what he talks about, the people he talks about, there's his father's name and that kind of thing. So that shows you all the kinds of things we're trying to detail and describe. And each one of these things that we have here is searchable. So it creates a moment of a testimony that can be found within the 13 years of testimony that, total that we have, right? So you can come here to this, this discussion of a synagogue attack in 1941, you could also come to uh, another discussion of synagogue attacks that happened in the 2000s. In, which, in is, which is great. So let's go, well, let's use that to jump off. Um, how would we go about finding that? Mm, well, I would, I would, I mean, we know the name of the person we're looking for. We do, but we're not going to go that way. Because I, I, I've seen a couple questions in the chat about, okay, say you don't know somebody's name but you want to look. So let's use this as an opportunity to go back, go through another route. Um, yeah, like if you if you didn't know anybody in who has been interviewed and you were just wanting to learn what was in the archive and learn about things and you happen to be interested in Copenhagen, if you went to the index search and type Copenhagen, it's going to start to suggest things to you. Well, there's Copenhagen, the city, which is discussed in 190 testimonies throughout the 13 years. There's the Copenhagen bombings of 1985 that one testimony discusses. Then there's the Copenhagen shootings that I was just referring to and thinking about in my head. Yes, yeah, so um, let's, let's look at that one. And if you add that. So for those who don't know this history, in 2015, there was a shooting in Copenhagen and um, a police, uh, I'm sorry, not police officer, a guard at the synagogue was shot and killed. Uh, it was a very sad experience. So that brought up a lot of conversation about uh, contemporary anti-Semitism. And then we started doing interviews in, you know, different countries around the world that had these kind of anti-Semitic attacks. And of yeah. course. So when we see here somebody with Rabbi Melchior's last name, mm -hmm. which is Yair Melchior, who's also Rabbi Melchior. He probably uh, would lessen some Thank younger you. generations. I just want to focus on uh, the 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 uh, the attack or the current attack. You know, I'm just going to pause it there because we could watch this because this is a fascinating testimony. I know we have a limited amount of time. I hate to cut testimonies off like this. It's it feels very abrupt and unnatural. Um, but I just noticed this is, if I'm not mistaken. So he he mentions his his grandfather, but doesn't talk about his father, which is interesting. But isn't this a, a relative of Bent Melchior? This is Bent Melchior's grandson, who is okay. now the rabbi of in Denmark, the chief rabbi. So he's the rabbi in Copenhagen. So if you've ever been to Copenhagen and go to synagogue services there, um, 
so yeah, so they have a dynasty of, of rabbis in, in Denmark of this family. So, so, yeah. And yeah. then again, this is the indexing of his testimony, the people he talks about, the events that he talks about, um, and making it relevant. Yes. So, you know, I got connected to this family because we're, we're, let's let's kind of go towards experiences now. I see some people in the chat are asking about, like, say they're a teacher or want to fill in about experiences. So in my grandmother's story, I love to focus on rescuers. It's, it's a piece of history that I, I feel very passionate about learning about. So I want to learn about other rescues. Um, why don't we start with the rescue of the Danish Jews? Because that's this history intersects. So let's start there. But then I also want to learn about other rescues in history. So take me down that rabbit hole. Oh, there, okay. There's more than one way you could go. So I, I jumped into this a little bit. But one way you could go, this is our experience group search. And then you can see the different kind of kinds of interviewees that we have and they include rescuers, right? So one way to go would be to click on the rescuers. Oops. And then you could say, well, we're interested in a rescuer who's from Denmark. Click on there. And we've got 14 rescuers from Denmark. And then you could go next. And then, you know, these ones are all available. You could, and have you know, marvelously are in English, so you could watch them right away. Um, so that's one way. So testimonies of rescuers. We took, uh, gosh, I was going to say off the top of my head how many rescuers we have, but I don't know if I can remember. Oh, yeah, it is a th more than a thousand rescuer testimonies that we recorded. So, you know, quite a good collection of them. Um, you could go back also to the index search. Right. And that that number of rescuers is just the Holocaust. Right. I mean, because we can yeah, also yeah. Get rescue missions from Rwanda or um, yeah, other have, other places. We have some Armenian rescuers, some Rwandan rescuers. Right. I think that's it for the rescuers. But in, in some of the bigger other collections that we have of genocide testimonies, there are rescuers in those collections, too, that are interesting. I don't know how much you want me to go into that. There's stories about all of them. Right. Um, yeah. No, it's OK. Well, because well, I know we have about. A few minutes before we start looking at some other stuff so um go ahead keep on with what you're oh i mean the only other i mean you can get into the this is the stuff that i like and that i would you know happily help people explore but getting into the index search and then you're starting to go you know discrimination responses um aid giving and then you're getting into the whole world of, you know, different kinds of ways that people helped, you know, clothing provision, education assistance, employment assistance. In any one of these terms, let's say employment assistance, you could add and then go next and it's going to pull up some results. And OK, maybe Russian's not your language, um, but you could sort of narrow it down to just English ones. And, you know, all these people talk about just that one kind of concept of people being helped to find jobs, you know, for example, would be, be something you could explore. So there's so much. I mean, there really is a lot kind of conceptually you could get into as well. And yeah, yeah, show I us. Could in, I could go in super in depth on this and I'm trying to restrain myself. Cause... Yeah, that's okay. Well, we have lots of questions coming up in the chat. So this is great. Um, and a, a few people are asking about how do they, two, two questions coming up. One, how do they get a testimony? So how do they say they find a family member in the archive? How do they get that file, that digital file for themselves? And then two, say they have a family member who's not in the archive, that maybe an oral history has been recorded um, and that person has passed away or perhaps that person's still alive and they want to be recorded. Where, what should they do to uh, get the testimony into our archives? So, okay, so part of question. Second question first. Um, we are still recording a small number of um, Holocaust survivor interviews today, every year. Um, so, you know, we have a thing called the Last Chance Collection. Um, and, you know, we do have um, a grant to continue that effort. So I would say if you wanted the Shaw Foundation to record your relative's interview, for example, or somebody you know's interview, um, have them get in, or a family member get in touch with us, and then we can start making arrangements to, to record their interview. We've been doing interviews through the pandemic. 
So we began doing remote interviews. We do some in-person interviews in certain circumstances at the moment, but we're not stopping because we're aware that um, you know, time is not on our side. So we're finding ways to do either remote interviews or in-person interviews in a safe way. Um, so yes, it'd be answer to that is, you know, contact us. Obviously there are other organizations that do um, oral histories as well. Um, so contact us or them or, you know, but we, we would happily record these interviews. What was the first question again? First oh. question is how do they, um, how do they get it? And then I have another question for you after that that just came in. <laughs> so we have another website, sfiaccess.usc.edu. Go there. And then... I'm popping uh, that in the chat for everybody. Yeah. And then on the, the leftmost thing here, obtain copies for interviewee and family. So, and, you know, we'll send you a free digital link to the, you know, downloadable uh, link to the testimony. And um, great, thank you, Crispin. And another question that came in, and I, I mentioned uh, in the chat for folks that if we don't get to all your questions during this, there's lots coming in, which is very exciting. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I put my email in there and I'll add my email again. So feel free to send an email. Um, but another question was, what about just audio? Are there any yeah. only audio or if somebody has just audio, can they submit it? Do we take, testimonies like that like i know usHMm does and there's lots of other archives like what is show foundation yeah. Policy so yeah we, we we today you know do work with audio only testimonies um we didn't initially we were sort of video interview only but recently we've begun to integrate audio testimonies um we're not a hundred percent set up to just take in individual submissions yet. Um, usually we take in larger collections that we fundraise to bring in because of our, you know, preservation and indexing costs money and we have to cover that cost. So we're not normally doing kind of individual submissions of existing testimonies. Um, we hope to be able to do that in the future. We just aren't there yet. Uh, but, you know, of testimonies that are part of other collections that are audio only. Yes, we do that too. We're actually working on one right now from uh, Dearborn in Michigan. And if say, okay, another question just came in that I love. I love this question because uh, I recently got to do this, but if folks want to become interviewers, can they do that? Yes, uh, we are, uh, we do have a, like an online training for interviewers and we, you know, we're, we're interested in, you know, especially people that are really good at interviewing. And we, I know, a number of people probably on this call may even have interviewed for us in the past and that's a wonderful thing or or have a lot of interviewing experience and knowledge and that would be great we'd happily welcome people um yeah we ba basically the answer is yeah we've, we've got some issues just right at the moment due to some staff changes that are slowing things down right in the month of january but i'm hoping we'll be back up and running to keep that going you know shortly and I would, I would encourage anybody who's interested in that. I mean, like I mentioned, I came from the field of journalism and I took the training to, and I did my first interview during the pandemic. Um, and I've interviewed people for, you know, over a decade professionally. And I took the course from Crispin and it was like such a different way to think about asking questions. So, you know, the, the whole process of taking an oral history is just a really fascinating one to learn about. So if there's any part of you that, you know, wants to honor your family members legacy by starting to collect other stories from people. Um, I definitely encourage you to, to look further into it. It's a really, it's a really special thing to, to get to do. Um, okay, so we are at uh, 8.40 right now on East Coast time. Um, I think that we had a few people in who are here today that might have had family members in the archive. And I think you've pulled up a couple of their so let, let's look at some other family stories and then we're gonna open up for, um, I mean, we've been doing Q&A the whole time, but we're gonna do a dedicated 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Yeah, th there's definitely a number of people that, that told us about you know relatives who were interviewed and I'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> come to the first one and I apologize to people I exclude, but the, you know, there's lots of people and we could look up other ones, but um, one person wrote to us and said her grandparents are in there and absolutely are. And probably the easiest way is to look it up. The last name is Ehrlich, if I do. 
uh, interviewee only and, and hit search. We have lots of Ehrlichs, um, but her grandparents were uh, Rose and Moses. And if I scroll down, what you're looking for, interviewee here, so it's this column that has the name of the interviewee. So there's Moses, Let's check there. And here's Rose. And when you hit next, you go there. And then, you know, if we hit on the, the picture or on the name, then it would go start opening up the interview. Um, yeah, I would definitely encourage people, like I think what, what Rachel was saying earlier, there can be some things where you hit kind of, you seem like you hit a dead end. And just, I mean, and I think this would be the same kind of thing that you'd find if you use Ancestry or other genealogy websites. Sometimes you have to kind of, play around a little bit. Notice that we have the option of starts with exact match and contains. So like with Rachel's example, you, you know, starts with H or, well, Hannah's definitely probably H or contains an H-A-N, you know, you can play around with it. And then, well, it definitely has D-U-B, let's do interviewee only. So you're playing around a little bit with the names to find people. Um, sometimes like that. Another thing that we have, and I'm just sorry, I'm going to use, oh, I'll use the Ehrlich example again. If I hit this, bo this box here, phonetic matching, this is, this is helps you find other spellings of the name. So if I click that and then type in Ehrlich, it's going to drop down some other things that we have. So you know, maybe somebody spells it just E-R-L, not E-H-R-L. And you could search on that and see what happens there. Yeah, a number of the interviewees have that version of the spelling, for example. So, you know, to play around with it and try different spellings using the phonetic spelling and that kind of thing can help you find names. Uh, do you want me to bring up some other names of people who might? Yeah, let's bring up one more. And then a couple of questions um, while you do that, uh, which is that there's only what you said, 4,000 testimonies available on in this online archive, roughly? Well, no, I mean, all the testimonies can be searched and found here. So all the data about all okay. the data about the testimonies is available. You can only watch 4,000 okay. immediately online, right? Okay, so anybody can find anybody in through this platform, but to watch the entire testimony, you might need to request it. So you might need to go to that request link, which I will put again in the chat. Um, I will also let folks know that Show Foundation has a YouTube channel. Not every testimony is on YouTube, but you will find a lot and sometimes some clips. So if you, you know, are, <laughs> feel compelled, um, you can also find some testimonies there. And I just popped that into the chat and I'll put the access site. Um, I'll, I'll put all the links in there again. So they're just easy. Um, and Crispin, we have a que question from Megan here that are non-family members able to request a testimony? How does that work? I mean, right yeah. now, uh, I mean, normally speaking, um, we would direct people to one of our, you know, more or less 150 access sites around the world, uh, most, many of which, or most of which are in the US. So rather than uh, sending people testimonies, we'd be saying, you know, please go to, let's say, USHMM, and you can watch this testimony, or Columbia University, or NYU, or other places that um, have access to the testimony. Um, during the pandemic, we've been, I mean, you know, sending testimonies to people when they're kind of earnestly requested as well. So, it, you know, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think there's, and this is a great question, it's one that I had, like, somebody's asking about, like, documentary work or education or projects, and um, this archive is just such a fantastic tool for those of us who work in that field. I mean, I really, it's like, if, if you're writing a piece and you want to fill in descriptive details of what a place is, being able to use this archive is a really wonderful way to do that, of course, you know, under all the, the ethics of doing documentary work and whatnot. Um, so I highly suggest this for those purposes as well, not just, you know, personal family history. Just as you were talking, so I know um, one of the other participants today 
uh, I think mother or grandmother is Ruth Mermelstein, uh, you can, who is, whose maiden name was Genuth. So you can also search on maiden names. So it's not just, you know, a single version of the name. There could be multiple different variants of it that, are, that were, were known to us and that we entered into the information. So maiden names can be found. Um, even false names that people used during the war, mm. if they were known to us, you know, so there's multiple different, you know, versions of people's names that all kind of help you find the testimony. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, also that names might be mentioned by other people. So, you know, a couple of years ago, um, well, not a couple, but time is weird in the pandemic, the end of 2020, we had this incredible story happen at the Institute that we re were able to reconnect to Holocaust survivors um, who hadn't seen each other since they were nine. And it was entirely because of um, someone at the Institute who used the indexing, uh, Ita Gordon, who's been working at the Institute for for Kristen, I think as long as you have. Um, yeah. And she was able to find, you know, long story short, reconnect these two people because one mentioned the other, like not both of them were in the archive, but so, you know, maybe your grandparent isn't in the archive, but you never know. Like if, if you do enough searching, you might be able to find some puzzle pieces where somebody mentioned somebody or, you know, some small, you know, town and, Eastern Poland or whatnot. Yeah, uh, I mean, this, is, this is a, you know, effectively a very powerful genealogical tool, right? You can find, you know, perhaps immediate relatives, perhaps distant relatives, perhaps friends, acquaintances, this kind of thing by searching on the names, you know, unchecking this interviewee only, right? Gives access to something like 2 million name records that we have from these testimonies. Mm -hmm. So it's 55,000 testimonies, but 2 million name records that come up because people talk about you know, all the different people that they met or that are part of their family. Um, yes, to the extent that they talk about them. Sometimes people don't mention names, but sometimes yeah. they mention a lot of names. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to throw some other just random questions at you that I'm, I'm seeing come in because we have about, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so left. Um, We've got so, 99,000 more to go. But yeah, yeah we, we, got, we got a lot of hours left. Um, and like I said, if anybody has follow-up questions, like, please, I encourage you to reach out. Like, you know, we want we want all of you in our community at Shoah Foundation. Um, I know that personally, my relationship with my family history has gotten so much richer since discovering this archive and just feeling like I can go into it whenever I want to learn more and to experience more through these memories that have been recorded for us, the next generation. Um, so some of, the, some of the questions coming in, there's one that is, what's the difference between the testimonies that Show Foundation is taking and the testimonies done by other institute? Is there a difference or is it really just the institution behind it? Uh, I mean, there are differences, right? Every institution will have, you know, slightly different way, you know, potentially anyway, slightly different ways of doing things. What I will say is that when the Shoah Foundation began interviewing in 1994, it was, of course, far from the first organization to take Holocaust survivor testimonies. There were many, um, you know, places, organizations, collections that had already formed by that point. And we, you know, consulted with, um, you know, people in San Francisco at USHMM um, brought, and brought people in who'd worked with other collections in Canada and elsewhere, and kind of, you know, fashioned the way that we do interviews based on some kind of synthesis of, of that, you know, then using our own people and then kind of, you know, things would go in our own way and put a slightly sort of show a foundation like version on it. But I think what I've noticed, because we have, we do have collections from, let me just go back a page. Um, you'll see here that our Holocaust testimonies, yes, we have our own collection of close, you know, 51 and a half thousand testimonies, but we also bring in collections recorded by other organizations. And you do notice differences um, from, you know, in the, in the interviews recorded by um, different I mean, I could go into that really. I don't know how much I hit time. Oh, let's we'll, we'll there are, there get into the weeds. I, I like to I like to get dig into that, but we can save that for another conversation. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we were influenced by existing practice, um, but there is some diversity of practice yeah. as well. And you'll and you'll get to see that when you watch some of the testimonies, and like if you decide to dig into 
some of the collections that are not the Holocaust, which I, I really recommend as well, like you'll notice for the Armenian genocide collection, the majority of those interviews, or I think really all of them were by two different documentarians um, or oral historians, excuse me, who, you know, one is without video and just audio, but they're both collections, if I'm, I think correct here, were recorded even before Shoah Foundation uh, began. So you're going to see a really different style. So you'll, you'll get, you'll see that as you, and if you've been watching testimony with other institutes, you might see differences. Um, just to get to some of these other questions here, um, Adele, who was an interviewer for Show Foundation, hi Adele, thanks for joining us, um, is asking if she's able to locate the interviews that she conducted years ago. So is there a way to find uh, interviews based off of who interviewed them? Uh, they're not in this search tool at the moment. We're working on a new version of the search tool that will come out next year, where you'll be able to search that for yourself. Right now, email me and I can send you a list of those interviews. Um, coming soon, a future, a future coming soon. <laughs> yeah, let me put my email in the chat. Okay. Um, and somebody is asking about second generation testimony taking, like, are we recording second and third generation and archiving their stories on behalf of the previous generation? Yeah, we have a pilot program to do that. It's currently on hold pending more funding, but it's something that we're, we have just at the very beginnings of exploring. And I think it's an exciting new development for that. Um, we have, it had, interestingly, and perhaps inevitably are the Armenian testimonies because they come from a generation, you know, the Armenian genocide was 1915. So a generation, generation and a half before the Holocaust. Um, we had in the, in, in the collections we've taken in of those, of that experience, there were some sort of second and third generation testimonies in there. And then, you know, we began, you know, thinking, oh, we really have to do this and really should be recording these interviews. So it's something we're interested in doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just temporarily on hold on an effort that we hope to explore further very soon. Yeah. And I would say, um, if you're somebody who wants to do that, um, this, this might sound a little silly, but even recording yourself, whether it's like via audio or writing prior to somebody else recording you is something that you can do to preserve memories. Because as we know, memory changes as time moves forward. So if you have a grandparent or a parent who recently passed away, it might be worthwhile to sit down with yourself or with another family member and just interview each other just to have that um, in, in the meantime. Um, somebody is asking that they have CDs of their family testimonies and looking for digitally, absolutely uh, reach out request that you know request testimony link um yeah. i actually i still have the vhs's for my grandmother's that i inherited when she passed away um so definitely we can get that for you yes. um and okay i think if there's other questions um feel free to get them in we have a few minutes left and about to pass it back to our wonderful hosts at 3g new york um I just want to thank you all um, for coming to this event. And Crispin, thank you for going through this. I actually learned a thank lot. You. I, love, I, I, well. could, <laughs> I, could, I could do this all day. I love talking about the archive. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I know. I, I always feel like it's, that's what I was saying earlier, it's, it's a special interest, but it really becomes like this really incredible thing when you start to get the hang of it and you really can find yourself in some really special, um, you know, curiosity tangents I don't know how you want to call it rabbit holes or however um and really it, it's a really wonderful tool so I'm going to pass it back we will include links um 3G New York I think we'll be sending out an email we'll include all the links I put in the chat um and again reach out to us reach out to show a foundation become a part of our greater community um I don't know as a as a fellow grandkid. It's just, it's really special to get to have these conversations together and to explore all of this stuff together. And yeah, just thank you to everybody. Um, so Farah, I don't know if you want to say any final words, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Crispin and Rachel. Um, I know I'll be using some of these techniques to, to try to learn more about my grandfather's story. Um, Thank you to the USD Shoah Foundation, 3G New Jersey, and 3G Philly for partnering on this fascinating event. If you'd like to make a gift to support our educational programs, please refer to the chat for ways you can donate. 
We hope to see you again soon. We have many events coming in the next couple of weeks to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We'll include the registration links in an email tomorrow, along with all the links that were shared tonight. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.